Now that we have discussed the concept of forces and the concept of motion, let's see how we can relate those two. So forces and motions, we are going to relate those two. So the fundamental equation that relates forces with the motion is Newton's second law, which says that some of the forces acting on a particle or a system is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, so that's the equation that we'll be using. Now for a particle, let's do an example. Let's say we have a particle and remember that particle is merely an idealization. It is not something that's necessarily a minuscule object. It could be something as big as a space aircraft. But for the purpose of our study, we are going to model it as a particle. So let's say there is a force F applied of 5 Newton on it, okay? And we tell you that its initial velocity of the, is zero. So the initial velocity of the particle is zero. And we are looking for its velocity at, let's say, time t equal to 5 seconds, okay? So the question is, what is this velocity after 5 seconds while this force of 5 Newton has been applied on this particle, on this object, okay? So we can definitely use this equation in this case, sigma f equal to ma. So we'll write that. Let's write our coordinate system, show our coordinate system x and y. So we have five i hat, that's positive. Let's neglect the friction in this case. So we have to draw the free body diagram. Okay, so five Newton, we've got the weight. So we have to be given the weight. Let's say the weight is one kilogram. So this will be uh, m times g. And we have the normal reaction and we're neglecting friction in this case. So five i hat plus n minus mg j hat equal to mass times acceleration. Now, what do we know about acceleration? Well, we know that this is moving only along x direction. So acceleration is only along x direction. So that'll be a sub x i hat plus zero j hat, where zero indicates the acceleration along y direction, which is zero because the your particle is not jumping up and down, right? So on the right hand side, I have only m times a sub x i hat. And on the left hand side, I have five i hat plus n minus mg j hat, okay? So if you compare the left side and with the right side, you can see this is a vector equation. On the left side, I have five, that should be equal to m times ax, and then n minus mg should be equal to zero because there's no j hat component on the right side. That makes sense, so then the vertical direction forces are balanced. So n is equal to one times 10, we're assuming g to be 10 meters per second squared, so that'll be 10 Newton, that's the normal reaction. Of course, this was not asked in the question. We're only looking for the velocity, but we get it as a byproduct. Uh, now let's look at our first equation. First equation is a sub x is equal to five over one. So that's five meters per second squared. Five meters per second squared. So we get the acceleration as five meters per second squared. And clearly it's a constant acceleration, which means that now we can use one of the Galileo's equation to find out what the velocity is. So, so from this point onward, now we are going to be doing motion analysis that we have seen in some of our previous videos. So we can use one of the Galileo's equation which says V equal to V zero plus acceleration times time. So V is equal to zero because initial velocity is given as zero plus acceleration is five. We just obtain that. Time is five seconds, so that's five. So that's 25 meters per second. So that's your velocity. So in this particular problem, you were given the force and you were asked for the velocity. Now forces give rise to acceleration, which in which itself manifests as change in velocity. So we were able to find the velocity as a result of it. Now this is this can be done, but a Newton's second law always applies, remember, in a Newtonian reference frame. But you will find that we will discuss an approach called work energy approach where solving these kinds of problems will be actually simpler if there is no time involved. If there's time involved, we don't have a choice. We have to find the acceleration and then get the velocity. But instead of this time, if let's say the distance traveled was given to us, we'll see that actually this, this equation, this, this particular problem will be easier to solve. But before we get to that, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is clearly valid for a particle. What about for rigid bodies? So physical models which are modeled not as minuscule particles, but as rigid bodies. It turns out that this law is still valid for them. So for rigid bodies, instead of writing sigma f equal to mass times acceleration, because now for rigid bodies, you can have multiple points. We will actually choose a specific point, center of mass, and write acceleration as acceleration of the center of mass. So if you on a rigid body, if you have multiple forces applied, let's say this is F1, this is F2, this is F3, and so on, then you can still add up all the forces in the vectorial fashion, 
and write it that equal to total mass times acceleration of the center of mass so whatever the acceleration of the center of mass might be and that would be varied so you have to pick the center of mass over here and write its acceleration on the right hand side to be able to use Newton's second law okay so that's what we have for the rigid bodies. So the same equation applies for the particles as well as for rigid bodies. For the particles, you know, there is no particular center of mass. All the points coalesce uh, into one single, converge into one single point. For rigid bodies, you have to pick a particular point because if you pick this point, this particular point may have a different, different acceleration from acceleration of center of mass. So AP may not necessarily be equal to a acceleration of center of mass. Okay, so that's one thing. But there is another fundamental equation that you actually need for rigid body motion, which is sum of the moment about center of mass is equal to what we call centroidal mass movement of inertia. So Ig is called centroidal mass moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So that's the other equation we need. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about central mass moment of inertia in a minute. But these two equations together are actually called Newton Euler equation. So it was a little, there was a little bit of Euler's contribution in formulating these equations uh, apart from the Newton. So they are called Newton Euler equation, something that you will learn about in quite some detail when you take engineering dynamics class. Now let's talk about Ig, central mass moment of inertia. Now what's central mass moment of inertia? Basically just as mass in Newton's second law represent, represents an, a resistance to the translatory motion, Ig or the central mass moment of inertia represents an inertia or resistance to a rotational motion. So think of mass and, and I, mass m and Ig, central mass moment of inertia, sort of analogous to each other. So one, so let me write this, so translation, and here we have rotation and we're talking about resistance to motion so resistance to motion in translation is mass and in rotation it is mass moment of inertia so the symbol is i sub g and this one is m okay so that's what IG is useful for. Now, how do we really get IG? Now, in MEC 101 class, IG will be always given to you, okay? But in reality, IG is defined as integral dm times r square for a rigid body. So dm is a infinitesimal mass. That's a dm, and this is center of mass, and the distance from here is r. You have to integrate it. So you need to develop some intuition for it. Don't worry about this formula. What it essentially says is that Central mass moment of inertia tells you something about how mass is distributed in a rigid body about the center of mass or, or to be more accurate about an axis that goes through the center of mass. Okay, so that's what it represents. So you can imagine if the mass is distributed far away from the center of mass, then this central central mass moment of inertia will be a larger term as opposed to the situation when the mass is, is closer to the center of mass. So when would that happen? So let's say I have a big ring. I have a big ring okay and this ring is basically you know of a small thickness some thickness this is the ring and you know this is the center of mass over here right here is the center of mass g so most of the mass which is which is shown in in the yellow shaded region is actually far away from the center of mass so in this case the central mass moment of inertia would be as large as it could be, right? Assuming that this is of infinitesimal thickness, right? So this is very, very thin actually. So for a ring actually, the mass moment of inertia about center of mass is given as the total mass times the radius squared. That's the formula. This is for a ring. So let me write it for a ring, okay? As opposed to that, if I take the a circle, right? And of the same radius, this is a G and this is the radius. And I, instead of a ring now, I actually have a disc so this is completely filled. So I'm going to fill this up. This is actually a disc, okay? Solid disc. In this case, the mass moment of inertia about center of mass is given as m times r squared over two is half of a ring. So this is for a disc. So you can see that in this case, there is average mass that is closer to the center of mass. And in the case of ring, it's farther, right? So this is only half of uh, the ring's uh, center of, of moment of inertia, okay? And that's the reason 
why if you look at the the bicycle wheels you want to have larger moment of inertia a larger mass moment of inertia for them so that once they're set in motion they they remain in motion for quite some time right so the resistance to the rolling motion to the rotation prevents it from getting into the motion but at the same time it also helps with letting it roll for a longer period of time once it has been set into the motion so these two equations over here are fundamental for the rigid bodies so let's do another example where we have actually pure rotation okay so i have let's say a disc all right and this could be a gear it could be a pulley it could be a wheel rotating about center of mass so this is doing a pure rotation okay this is doing a pure rotation and let's say there is a force f applied in a tangent direction like this all right there's a force f applied at tangent direction to rotate this wheel in the counterclockwise direction and this is at a distance of five centimeter uh, from the center of mass okay so the question is let's say if let's say this wheel this this disc is at zero speed initially so omega zero is zero radians per second okay and remember your angular speed and your angular acceleration should always be in radians per second or radians per second squared so if your your problem gives you these numbers in terms of degrees per second or um or revolutions per minute or anything like that yet you have to convert into radians per second or radians per second squared so the question is omega zero is zero radians per second after t equal to five second the question is what is its angular speed okay and you're given that you applied this force there and this is the kind of scenario that would happen with your robot design project too, where you'll have a motor which will be driving. So, you know, instead of something like this, you will actually have a motor connected over here and the motor will exert a torque or a moment. OK, and we'll see how we can relate that to the forces over here pretty soon. So here we have the force F. So what equation should we use? Well, if we use sigma F equal to mass times acceleration, this is a rigid body. So there has to be acceleration of a center of mass then we have to first draw the free body diagram remember we cannot use this equation unless we have the free body diagram so we have f this is a pin joint so i'll have g sub x you'll have g sub y okay and assume this is in a horizontal plane so the gravity is not playing a role so sigma f equal to m times a g this is zero because center of mass g is not going anywhere it's a fixed point so we have uh, this is this x coordinate this is the y coordinate so i got f plus g sub x i hat plus g sub y equal to zero i hat plus zero j hat so we get f equal to minus g x or i would say g x equal to minus f and g y is equal to zero okay so no vertical direction reaction and g x itself is equal to minus f but this this doesn't help us solve the omega f right this is where our second equation comes into the picture which is some of the moment equal to i g alpha so let's write that some of the moment about g equal to i g times alpha okay so what is the moment of f moment of f about g would be f times let's say this is 5 newton it will be 5 times 5 into 10 power minus 2 this will be newton per newton meter and that's along clockwise direction right because the moment about g would be negative so that's negative over here equal to ig now what's ig we're assuming that this is actually a disc so if this is a disc let me write it disc then for a disc ig is m times the which is the mass so we need to know the mass let's say mass is five kilogram okay i don't know why i'm picking all fives here but that's fine five times five into ten power minus two r square over two so here i've used the formula ig equal to m times r square over two which is for a disc okay times alpha which we don't know okay so we'll find that out so this is five times five so what do we get here we have 5 into 25 into 10 power minus 4 over 2 here i've got minus 25 into 10 power minus 2 so this 25 25 cancels so what do we get this 10 power minus 2 will become this 10 power minus 2 so we get minus 2 over 5 into 10 power 2 on the left hand side and that is equal to alpha so alpha is equal to minus 0.4 into 10 power 2 so that's what minus 40 minus 40 radians per second square so alpha came out to be minus 40 radians per second square yes okay so we get the alpha from that uh, that doesn't give us the omega so how do we get the omega now we know the definition of alpha we have seen this is defined as d omega over dt rate at which angular speed itself changes so so this is so we can integrate it alpha dt would be equal to d omega changing from omega 0 to omega f 
omega 0 is given as 0 so this is actually a 0 quantity and uh, this would be integral 0 to time so we get omega f minus omega 0 which is 0 equal to alpha alpha we just found is minus 40 and t is equal to what uh, t is equal to 5 seconds so that's 5 so that's minus 200 okay so we get omega f equal to minus 200 radians per second okay 